Nine. This time. Evening ladies, I can see everybody slowly joining, which is great. And uh, we will just wait for a few more people. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, Liz. <laughs> and uh, feel free to turn off your hi. <laughs> feel free to turn off your screen because it's being recorded and uh, it'll be loaded up on YouTube later. So if you're not wanting your beautiful face on YouTube, which I highly, highly encourage because it's so beautiful and it needs to be shared with the world, uh, you can turn off your camera. <laughs> Just give a few more minutes. It's supposed to be quite a reasonable turnout tonight. I think they're all a little bit late. So just give them a bit of time. <laughs>
Okay, good evening. We will start now and uh, the others can come in when they come in. So first of all, thank you very much for joining me this evening. It is uh, always good to see like-minded people wanting to learn more things and I hope to provide value for you tonight in this uh, fabulous, scary topic of best food for your dog. Is there such a thing? Yeah, let me just... Okay, so just a bit of an introductory to myself is uh, why would I, what makes me qualified to be talking to you and what do I really do? So I've got a vet practice called Amity Vets in Devon and I'm a practicing vet myself. So um, certainly seeing customers every day, talking about food and all these sort of uh, different topics that we get to see on a daily basis, which I'm very, very thankful for. I'm also a business owner, so I do own uh, Amity Vets. Always want to my own vet practice. Um, I've also written a book, which we'll discuss a little bit at the end of the um, presentation, if you're interested. As you can see, I also try to provide value by speaking, usually face-to-face -face, uh, at uh, live events, but because of coronavirus, we have uh, gone on to the modality of Zoom, which actually randomly allows me to reach much further audience. That's all very, very boring, sort of official stuff. I also have a little bit of a sense of humor. This was done between jobs, whereby uh, I decided to uh, write the word vet on my head. Before I uh, forget, if you have any questions, please do type into the chat box and uh, we will answer all questions at the end of the presentation. I also am a pet guardian. This is uh, little Gabriel over there. He was brought in by two burly policemen, uh, found this little hamster wandering up and down heavily. And I took him on and you can see that he's a bit of an escape artist, which uh, you can see has already dug a little hole on the side over there. And once I covered that up with the drain cover, he dug another hole just beside it, having a hamster running loose in your kitchen. Uh, it's no fun because you can't really use the oven for about two weeks before we finally found him again. I'm also a, a father, you know, I have two little boys. I was back in the army in Singapore, I did the national service, so I was uh, also an infantry officer, or rather I am still an infantry officer. Occasionally I do salsa as well, so that it's uh, when I'm not vetting. And I also play basketball, water polo, roller skate, and more recently became an capoeista or doing capoeira. Why do I mention this? It's just because I believe that we are more than what we are. When somebody asks, what do you do? How do you introduce yourself? Do you say that I'm a dog trainer or I'm a shopkeeper or I'm American or I'm German or I'm British? I believe that we are so much more. So I just wanted to relate to you that I'm not just a vet, just like all of us. We're not just, just our professions. We do have our outside life as well. We are so much more than what we are. Never ever forget that. Do not let your profession or your occupation or your nationality define who you are because you are so much more. <clears throat> okay, now to the crux of the matter. What are we going to discuss tonight? I've got a fairly interesting uh, presentation prepared for you over here, which I hope to impart value to you. We're gonna go through some very, very basic principles. Yes, we're talking about the best food for the dog, but let's just run through some aims and principles of feeding. Why do we do it in the first place? You may find that it may not be what you think. A bit of history of dog food. Well, when did it come? Did it actually exist during the caveman times? Was there a concept of dog food? And I mean, looking at right now, you think the concept of dog food has been around for quite some time. You may be surprised. We talk about dry food. We talk about wet food, and we all we can not talk about raw feeding. And certainly, we can discuss about other diets as well that may be quite uh, uh, common out there. And just to give you an idea of what's what is out there and what makes it different. And we we'll summarize it in the end, and talking about what's next. Okay, getting into aims and principles of feeding. So let's just try to remind ourselves, why do we feed? Well, certainly keeping the dog alive, we all need food. That's one of our basic necessities. So keeping dog alive is certainly right on the list to do that. But let's be a little bit more sophisticated, okay? Achieving a thriving life, how to keep your dog not only alive, but live the best life that it could because of the diet. We are what we eat. We know that what we put into our bodies reflect our energy level, and our sort of uh, our daily um, 
doings, what we can do every day, what we're capable of doing, how do we eat? So we reflect a lot on, on how we eat to the dogs, trying to help them to achieve a thriving life, not just keeping them alive. And certainly, there is the pet guardians or the owner's convenience and confidence. How confident are you in feeding a particular diet? How confident are you in home cooked food? How confident are you, uh, how convenient it is for you to feed a raw food diet or how convenient it is for you to feed a wet food or dry food? What's the easiest? So certainly that factor comes in as well and that plays a quite a huge um, idea of why we should be feeding in the first place. So just a little bit of history. Back in 1860, there's this guy called Jack Spratt. He's actually British, so he's actually from UK. He actually noticed the docks, uh, or rather along the docks of the bay, whereby there were ships over there. And he noticed dogs were eating biscuits that was given by sailors. And uh, they were just feeding those biscuits. And he was thinking, okay, that is interesting uh, because he was an electrician. And he saw those biscuits being fed and he sort of had a concept of maybe there is something to that. Maybe there is a market for a commercially available dog food that's avail uh, that, that is made easier to give rather than them just eating scraps of food, which is what they used to do before from dinner and just giving a bit of food from a bit of dinner and things like that. So he was the one who actually conceptualized the whole idea of having a commercial dog biscuit. Then, after that, 30 years later, the USA in America was introduced to the above formula. That's when they brought it to America, and that's where they sort of targeted the rich people who could afford to buy dog food rather than just giving scraps of food on their own. It's only, you know, a good 60 years later, as you can see, where they actually introduced wet food. So canned dog food was introduced. It was mainly horse meat and they were actually using a lot of horse meat and they were, they were trying to hide it as well. So they wrote it in very, very small letters just below the can of what the dog food was or rather what it was made out of. And uh, that tried to go untraced, but that was when it all started, the canned dog food. So as you can imagine, it is no more than 100 years ago. 1960. Okay, that's where they actually created specific food for nutrition, uh, nutritional care for puppies. So it's not just a normal dog food anymore. They said this one is especially good for puppies. Bear in mind, up to now, there is still no point, at no point in time, have they actually analyzed what does a dog need? What nutrients does a dog need? What is actually in the food? They just literally gave it, call it dog food and call it a complete food, call it, call it a complete diet and just sold it as such package. In the mid eighties, it was only then, can you imagine mid eighties? That's, so that's not even 40 years ago, where the US, the National Research Council, they published nutritional requirements for a dog. It's only then all this so-called dog food that started from 1860 was actually question, okay, have you actually uh, considered what does a dog need in terms of nutrition to put into the food? Or are you just selling it and marketing it as dog food? That is very, very interesting. 93, bath diet study in Australia. So bath, we're talking about sort of the start of raw feeding, okay? Uh, it started actually in Australia. Then after that, slowly it came over to UK. So as you can imagine, raw feeding is only, or rather official raw feeding hasn't really started that long really. It's back in 93, so to speak. So let's discuss a little bit about dry food. So how exactly is dry food made? Okay. It is made by this process called extrusion. What exactly does that mean? So what it means is that all the ingredients that they're, they, they, they're going to cook into the food, they mix it together, heat it up, so it's all mixed into a mash. So it becomes like one whole big uh, slurp, so to speak, one whole big soup. Then they heat it up and they dry it and they extract all the moisture out of it. Okay, so the advantage is that, yes, they have got everything inside there, but the disadvantage is that the whole structure of it, the whole way it is made, is made with very high heat and extract all the fluid out. As you can imagine, the nutritional value may have dipped quite a bit as well. Um, as it's usually all cereal based, okay? And after that, when they have done it, they lay it all the way flat, 
Okay, then after that, they cut into little pieces, which we call kibble. So depending on what sort of shape that you're wanting or, or, or they're manufacturing, that's where the kibble comes out. So that's extrusion. So it's three to 11% water. Okay, as you can imagine, it's not a lot of water at all. Okay, and it's actually the market leader. So in US, $8 billion worth was sold in 2010. So one advantage is that it is convenient, it is cheap, it's also an energy dense. Because it is dry, there is not much special need to keep it in a fridge or anything like that, okay? And it stays, uh, it, it doesn't go off as fast compared to uh, wet food. It's also quite cheap because they can do quite a lot in the big bulk, okay? And because they've packed all the energy in the little kibble and very, very little water content, it's also quite energy dense. The disadvantage is that uh, it can, it may not taste very good. I mean, you have heated all this whole mash up and dehydrated it. it they usually use quite a high grain level, okay? That's been associated with other issues. Um, and certainly to keep it from going off, they would have to add some preservatives. So it is not as pure as food can be. And so they have some preservatives inside there. So this is just a, interesting little diagram to actually remind us how does a dog look at the food is the shape for us or for the dog okay what about wet food how is it made that's a little bit more interesting so same again the soup okay they mix the ingredients together is heated to sterilize at, at least 77 degrees they mix all the ingredients together and as you can compare to the dry food, which is three to 11% water, wet food is 60 to 78% water. So it is similar in a way whereby it is heated to sterilize at least as well to a quite high degree temperature, okay? And all the ingredients are mixed together. The biggest difference is that they retain the water. So you could almost argue, almost, not entirely, if you have your dry food, you add in water, it technically becomes wet food, so to speak, okay? So wet food, you, tend to pay more for the water content itself. So one of the advantages is that it is highly palatable because it is more, it's, I wouldn't use the word fresh, but it is more tasty. It's a bit more wet. It's not just eating dry biscuit, okay? And it's also quite high in protein as well. The disadvantages are that it does need higher volume because a lot of it is water. So compared to eating energy dense dry food, eating low energy dense, wet food, you need more of it, okay? Uh, and it's also more expensive because uh, of the packaging as well. You can't, you can't buy more for, uh, it's like for a bag of food, you can buy a big bag of food and that will last you for two weeks to a month. Whereas wet food, it's all little tins, okay? And hence the packaging is more expensive itself. As high as spoilage because you can't keep it as long because it is wet food. And it can be linked to wet, uh, weight gain as well because usually when they feed wet food, they tend to feed a bit more because they think that it is a low water content. And sometimes they can be of a, a weight gain due to that, just due to feeding really, or not the food itself, but it's the way that it's being fed. So, Many, it's not uncommon for many pet guardians to say that my dog prefers wet than dry. Okay, so let's talk about raw feeding. Okay, so you have initially started with uh, this RMBD or raw meat based diet. Okay, then after that, obviously, we have heard of bath diet as well. That's coming from Australia. Okay, um, so what does bath stand for? It stands for biologically available raw food. Okay. Then after that, they also had the prey model diet whereby they feed the entire carcass. So how it is prepared, usually it is uh, it's either fresh or it's dehydrated and it's frozen, okay? So there's also quite a high water content in it because it is the entire carcass or you know parts of the carcass and our body is made up of pretty much 70% of water. So if you're gonna be feeding carcasses, be it parts or the entire carcass, you can expect a quite high uh, amount of uh, water content inside there. 
it is a slow and it is a growing market. It's still quite small, as you can imagine right now. It is still less than 1% of market share, which sounds astounding considering how much raw food is there out there that uh, people are sort of converting into raw food diet. But it's still a very, very small market. It just goes to show how big the dry food market or the processed food market is. So advantage is health benefits. I put a question mark there because it certainly can benefit uh, many dogs in many ways, but certainly it is not guaranteed. So, you know, it depends on what your dog needs. And the argument behind that, oh, not argument, but the sort of pros behind that is that it makes you feel as though you are closer to nature because in the wild, wild dogs, they hunt animals. So that is how they eat rather than eating processed biscuit that came up from a factory or processed tin food. So it is much closer to nat uh, nature. It is more natural. It is more wholesome to an extent. So this advantage does include sort of increased care of handling because it's no longer just handling dry biscuits, uh, potential infectious organisms. And unfortunately, some of those organisms like Salmonella, Campylobacter, even Jardia, they can be uh, zoonosis as well. They can be spread to humans. We can discuss that a little bit more later. So what other diets are there outside there? You may have heard of this particular diet called the senior diet. It's for older dogs, okay? And so what's the difference? Why senior diet? What is, what is different from the normal diet? Usually it's much lower calorie. And the idea behind that is that as animals get older, just like humans, the energy output isn't as much. They don't need as much energy to, they don't go as longer walks or things like that. Or subsequently, another, another school of thought would be they are a little bit more efficient in actually extracting the energy that they have from the food to, to sort of uh, release it in their outgoings. So because they're more efficient, they may not need to eat as much. It is not uncommon to, he to, to hear about that, especially in uh, people as well. You know, when they're older, they tend to eat less. So it's much lower calories so that they don't get too fat when they get older. That can predispose them or make their arthritis worse. The digestible protein is also much better. Okay, so they include more sort of beetroot fiber and things like that to help them to digest better. The idea behind that, whether it's true or not, is that the intestines, because they're older, may not be as easy digested. Same is extrapolated from human uh, sort of a nutrition, whereby we know older people, they may not be able to digest much, uh, much a more sort of a complex uh, food that we used to eat when we were teenagers or in our 20s, which is a long, long way ago for me anyway. You guys all look very, very young. But how we eat is very different from how, how we eat when we're older is very different from how we eat when we're a teenager when we're much younger. And that's the whole idea behind that. The protein is much more easier to be digested in senior diets. Sometimes they even add in things like glucosamine, chondroitin, um, uh, green lip muscle, omega-3s, just to, for sort of joint supplements and they add it in just because they feel uh, older animals they are much more prone to arthritis or even because it's just a supplement it doesn't do any harm so it's not uncommon for them to include that as part of the package in the senior diet as well the gi health gastrointestinal health is uh, much more uh, potentially much more delicate and hence as i mentioned earlier they would want to help to improve that so they include things like beetroot pulp uh, that is a good digestible fiber to push the poop along. Uh, flaxseed, which is also a very good antioxidant, omega-3s and things like that. So all that's similar to the idea of joint supplements. They, will in, they may include that inside the diet as well to market it better as a senior diet. Senior citizens or senior dogs potentially can get things like senior dementia as well. So they also add in a bit of cognitive health like vitamin E, L-carnitine, and these are all very, very good antioxidants to help to try to keep the brain active. Certainly in older animals, they may uh, need extra help in their skin and their coat health as well. So they add things like a linoleic acid and vitamin A to try to improve the integrity of the coat to make them have a nice and glossy coat. It is not uncommon when you see older animals, their coat may not be as fine and shiny as a two-year-old dog. The, the, that's the whole perks or things that we go through when we're getting older. It's uh, certainly in dogs as well, which is why they would add those supplements in there as well. 
To improve the immune system, which is not uncommon as well, they may also add essential fatty acids like omega-3 and 6 that's been shown to improve the immune system. Uh, the whole idea of it is uh, similar to humans, really, whereby the older you are, potentially your immune system may be uh, compromised. And hence, uh, any help is good. Well, a low protein diet, we've heard of that. Okay, sometimes uh, um, they talk about a protein level that is quite specific, how many percent, how many percent. And many people have said that the, uh, the dog benefits from a low protein diet because high protein diet may make them hyper. Let's investigate that. So minimum protein is what, 18%. Question mark for behavior issues, for weight loss, you don't gain as much food, uh, as much weight. Um, and certainly it's not indicated to use in growth phases, like uh, if they are, if it's a bitch having puppies, or if it is a very young dog that's growing, um, that is, uh, we shouldn't be giving them low protein diet because uh, they may actually need extra protein. So the advantage of that is that, you know, potentially less protein and that 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 is also sim similarly extrapolated from human medicine uh, or human nutrition the protein actually if it's not just digested well in your belly it actually uh, starts uh, putrefy or short a uh, fancy word for saying rotting okay so if you have a low protein diet it's been uh, sort of uh, found that they may have better gastrointestinal health because there's low protein inside there to putrefy less and which may also link to a longer lifespan. And we know in human medicine anyway, that gastrointestinal health is extremely important. It's, it's almost directly related to longevity. So the better you take care of your stomach, of your gut, of your intestines, the longer it can serve you and allow you to live longer. It is not, um, it is not too far-fetched to extrapolate that to doggy medicine as well, or doggy lifespan. You take care of their guts, you allow them to live longer. So one of the disadvantages is that there is a reported increased risk of coprophagia, which is eating its own poop or eating other people's poop. Um, and that or not people, other dogs poop. And the idea behind it is that it, the protein may be so low that the dog is not satisfied and it feels hungry. And hence uh, it, like, it finds a need to start eating uh, other dogs or its own poop. Question mark limiting amino acids because amino acids are the, break, uh, are the building blocks of protein. So if you give a low protein diet, sometimes you may be limiting some essential amino acids that's actually needed for growth, which is why it's certainly not used in growth phases in young dogs and uh, in reproduction. This is uh, from who likes the police, you know, <laughs> uh, every breath you take. I thought it was quite funny. What about hypoallergenic diets? Okay, we've certainly heard of those. You've heard of people uh, going to get some specific hypoallergenic diets, usually because there is some issues of having skin problems or having diarrhea, that uh, they have a uh, adverse reaction to the protein that they're eating or the food that they're eating, okay? So the idea behind it is that it's not usually given normally. If your dog is healthy, there shouldn't be any reason why you should go on any sort of hypoallergenic diet. However, if your dog has got persistent skin issues, that you may be thinking that it could be something that's eating or gastrointestinal sensitivity, like having persistent diarrhea and things like that, which could be uh, almost like the doggy version of IBD, irritable bowel disease. Uh, and it's whether there is, a, th 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 there is a something that's triggering or irritating the guts. Uh, and you may want to consider hypoallergenic diet. So the whole idea behind that is that you either use a novel protein, i.e. if you've been feeding your dog on a chicken-based diet, then, um, or you know, chicken rice-based diet, then you may want to choose a novel protein like salmon or ostrich, something that the dog hasn't had, sen hasn't had the chance to sensitize it to, to allow our little friend there to eat something without triggering off the belly. And usually they find a uh, novel uh, carbohydrates as well, like sweet potato or something like that. So that is one school of thought, okay? Another school of thought is using hydrolyzed protein. So hydrolyzed protein, so fundamentally what it means is that if that is, let's, let's pretend that it is a chicken that your dog is allergic to, and this is the chicken protein, okay? What happens is that on the chicken itself, okay, because of the protein, there are a lot of little uh, sensors up there, little receptors out there that causes the irritation, 
okay? Hydrolyzed protein is talking about they break this structure to such small little structures, still chicken, but it breaks such very, very small little structures that there isn't any more sensors. So because it is hydrolyzed, the dog can still eat the chicken, but because it's hydrolyzed protein, all the sort of uh, irritating uh, receptors that causes the allergy reaction is gone, and hence it doesn't have the effect on the dog anymore for the allergy, uh, in terms of the allergy, because you have removed all the little allergens. So that is what we call hydrolyzed protein. So usually, hypoallergenic diet, if you're going to put something on it, you either use a novel protein, something that your dog hasn't had before, or use a hydrolyzed protein, okay? And fundamentally, you're stripping the food of all irritants, of potential uh, irritants that you can uh, sort of uh, cause, a, cause an effect in the dog's stomach. And that is what we're talking about. You also heard of low carb or even grain-free, like, uh, like grain-free diets, okay? So what is different in that? So there's minimal to no grain as a source of carbohydrates, okay? Usually the sort of uh, alternative they use is sweet potato. So talking about how digestible starch is, because the argument behind that is that the dog, yes, is omnivore, but it may not be as well uh, suited to digest cereal-based diets or starch itself, okay? And hence, they are finding that it is, um, it is, uh, it is, it is uh, potentially good to give them a grain-free diet. Okay, they also there's a 2009 uh, 19 paper whereby they have linked uh, mycotoxin to grain or increased risk of mycotoxin to grain or cereal-based diets, which supports okay um, the use of grain-free diet. However, in the same year in 2019 as well, grain-free diet has been linked to heart disease as well. So. Uh, and what they found is that uh, it may have an increased risk of having heart disease if your dog is fed a predominantly a grain-free diet. So that is very interesting, really, how um, things have changed to say that actually grain-free may not be the healthiest because there may be a predisposed risk to heart disease. So things to watch out for. What about vegetarian or vegan diet? You know, certainly plant-based diet. You know, it is, uh, it is uh, getting much more uh, renowned or well-known or, or, or practiced by many people. And uh, it is not unusual for them to say that, look, I'm a vegan or I'm a vegetarian. My dog is going to be vegetarian as well. Is it actually possible? Can we give dogs no meat at all and just stick to a completely vegetarian or vegan diet? It turns out that it's actually entirely possible. Okay, it's usually linked with the guardian's belief, okay, and entirely possible in terms of nutritional requirements due to omnivore status. So it is actually able to break down, uh, obtain what it needs from just vegetables itself, okay? There, there, uh, there are some special considerations though. It does include sort of protein, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B12, taurine, L-carnitine, omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHA and e, uh, EPA. So these are usually quite readily found in meat. They are also found in vegetables, but it may not be as uh, readily available depending on exactly what the pet garden is feeding. If they know what they're doing, they can still replace all these sort of things using non-meat sources. Potential risk does include things like uh, alkaline urine and uh, nutritional sort of inadequacy. So alkaline urine, what is so scary about that? So we know that uh, in alkaline urine, potentially comparatively to acidic urine, uh, bacteria formation is much more common. Okay, so which also means that you could link, uh, it potentially you can get, a, you may get increased chance of a urinary tract infection, UTIs and things like that. Nutrition inadequacy, as mentioned to before, if the balance of the food is not right for the vegetarian or vegan option, then um, they may have issues in terms of whether you're actually feeding the dog its entire a complete diet or not. Being a vet, there's no way I'm going to finish or, or rather uh, not have scientific papers in this uh, presentation. So I've, se I've selected a few different sort of uh, papers to let you to stimulate your thinking and 
consideration of what to think of it. So this is in Vet Sciences back in 2017, so a fairly recent paper. So talking about inaccurate assessment of canine body condition score, body weight and pet food labels, a potential cause for inaccurate feeding. So never mind what food are you feeding. The question is, how much are you feeding of whatever you're feeding? And it's been found that, you know, 11% of pet guardians, they overestimate the body condition score and 19% of them overestimate the body weight, okay? Only 48% of them could correctly estimate their dog's body weight, okay? So if you do not weigh your dog, you do not see what the body condition score is like, how are you going to know how much food to give despite no, no matter what food you're giving? So only 23% and 43% 40, of pet guardians could correctly estimate how much wet and dry food to give respectively. Can you imagine 23% could correctly estimate how much wet food to give? Which means that more than three quarters of people have no clue of how much wet food to give. Okay, and less than 50%, less than half of the population have no idea how much dry food to give. Okay, so many pet guardians, they're not aware of their pet's body condition score and body weight and cannot actually accurately interpret pet food labels. So they may be thinking, okay, I want to feed my dog dry food or raw food or whatever sort of food they're going to feed. And they are very, very caring pet guardians. You know, they look at a pet label and they want to see gauge from there and see. But the point being is that if you do not actually know how much your dog needs, what's the point of looking at the label? It's almost like saying, I have no idea how much food I need to eat. I'm going to look at a label of bread or loaf of bread I'm going to eat right now. It, it, it doesn't make sense. So it is much, much more, more important to actually, for pet guardians to understand what does your dog actually need? Whether it's dry food, wet food, raw feed, how much do they actually need? Okay. So we talk about further sort of education to improve the skills is needed if the dogs are to be fed correctly at the right amount, uh, regardless of what um, food it's been given. It is uh, quite interesting. It's uh, when you, I'm sure you may have uh, experienced it before when you're walking in the park with a perfectly well structured, well built, perfect body condition dog. And somebody comes to say that your dog is too skinny. And you look at it, no, 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 my dog is just right. But the thing is that their perception of the right weight is very, very skewed. For example, in the UK, 70% of dogs are overweight. So fundamentally, you cannot blame them if they go to a park. That is what they see. That is their reference of how a healthy dog should look like. So that was very, very interesting. Okay. So same again, 2017. So let's talk about raw food. Okay, raw meat diet. Raw meat based diet influenced the fecal microbiome and end product of fermentation in healthy dogs. How does it actually affect the guts in terms of uh, the bacterial growth inside there? Because we know that our guts inside there, we have got bacteria. And it is very important for the bacteria to be well balanced. So the aim of the study was to investigate in dogs the influence of a raw-based diet supplemented with vegetable food on fecal microbiome in comparison with extruded, which we know is dry food. Okay, so what they do is two different group of dogs. One has a raw-based diet with vegetables and the other one is just dry food and they compare what is the fecal microbiome like. What sort of bacteria exists in the, uh, in, in the poop of these two group of dogs? So what they found was a decreased proportion of lactobacillus, paralactobacillus, and uh, Privotella genre was observed in the RMBD group in comparison to the dry food group. Just to remind us, okay, these three bacteria, they're not great bacteria. Okay, so you have to reduce it a little bit. Okay, the lower, uh, the higher there is, it's not great. Okay, the RMBD diet also significantly reduced the fecal score and increased the lactic acid concentration in the feces in comparison to dry food. Okay, so this result suggests that the diet composition does definitely modify the fecal microbiome composition, which is not unusual to think of, okay, and the end products of the fermentation. The giving of the raw feed diet promotes a more balanced growth of the bacterial communities and a positive change in the results of healthy gut function in comparison to dry food. So just looking at the quantity and the quality of the bacteria in the intestines itself for two groups of dogs that's given dry food and raw food, uh, raw, raw feeding. 
the quality of the poop, the quality of the bacteria flora in the raw feed diet appears to be much, much better. Okay, which is also not unusual thing. I mean, you're, you're eating dry food. So what, what do you expect? All we can say is if your dog isn't having any issues, which is not unusual because there are plenty and plenty of dogs on dry food without any issues, it just goes to show how versatile or how flexible or how, um, how forgiving the intestines can be regardless of what you're giving to, uh, to the intestines, which we can also correlate it to us. Imagine what sort of junk food we eat or not eat and how forgiving our intestines is. So something to consider. Okay, one last little paper. This is in a vet record, 2018. So a fairly recent paper as well. So talking about zoonotic bacteria and parasites found in raw base diets for cats and dogs. So they found that feeding, you know, you know, raw raw food to companion animals has become quite popular. And since uh, these diets may be contaminated with bacteria and parasites, they may pose a risk to both animal and human health. The purpose of this study was to test for the presence of zoonotic. Zoonotic, to remind us, means it can spread to humans. Of bacteria and parasitology pathogens in the Dutch uh, commercial uh, raw food diet. So they analyzed 35 commercially frozen raw food diet from eight different brands. And they found E. coli inside there, about in 23% of them, about eight from eight of them, and an extended uh, spectrum uh, sort of beta lactamase producing E. coli was also found in 20 products, which is 80% of them. Okay, they found a bit of listeria in about 54% of them in 19 products, and other listeria species in another 15 products. They actually also found Salmonella in seven products, 20%, and these are all the bacteria they found. The parasites, okay, they found some sarcocystics and also found some, uh, same again, sarcocystic but tenella, so different species. And they also found some toxoplasma, okay. So the results of this study does demonstrate the presence of potential zoonosis pathogens in frozen RMBDs that may be a possible source of bacterial infection in pet animals. And if transmitted, does pose a potential risk for the human beings. If non-frozen meat is fed, parasitic infections are also possible. So pet guardians should therefore be informed about the risk associated with feeding their animals RMBD. Bearing in mind, just because there is insight there and they eat it, okay, doesn't mean that they'll definitely get clinical signs of it. Okay. Um, so, but it does pose the fact that it is there. It is not, it is not, um, it is not completely harm free, so to speak, harmless, so, um, which is also why for people who are using raw feed, the basic hygiene still sort of, uh, it, it still it should be present, just like how we would prepare our raw meat in our own kitchen. You wouldn't be preparing raw meat and touching everything else. So similar for when you're preparing raw meat for your dog. So it is just that sort of uh, extra awareness of whether you should be, are you conscientious enough to be giving raw feed diet? Are you a naturally clean person or do you like leaving food around if you do then you know it may not be the best option uh, and that's why they've got dry food for uh, pet guardians who are not as fastidious because the potential of infection is present is real this is where i'm going to take a little two minute break just to get something for you so if you just bear with me and I will be right back. Okay, I am back. Okay, so I wanted to share this with you really. I thought it was quite interesting. So marketing, marketing. So we think that we buy dog food based on what we feel the dogs needs best. Okay, so this is just a little excerpt from a little marketing book I've re I, I read and I felt it was amazing. So I'm just gonna share it with you. 
the marketing of dog food. Dog food must be getting better. It must be getting better. It more, it's more nutritious and of course delicious. Americans spent more than $24 billion on dog food last year. The average price has skyrocketed and so has the gourmet nature of ingredients like sweet potato, elk, and free-range bison. And yet, I've never seen a dog buy dog food. Have you? Dog food may be getting, might, might be getting more delicious as it gets more expensive, but we actually have got no idea. We have no clue whether dogs enjoy it more because we are not dogs. But we can be sure that dog owners like it more because dog food is for dog owners. It is, it is for the way it makes them feel. The satisfaction of taking care of an animal that responds with loyalty and affection. The status of buying a luxury good and the generosity of sharing it. Some dog owners want to spend more on the dog food they buy. Some want gluten-free dog food loaded with high-value placebos. But let's not get confused about who is all this innovation for. It is not for the dogs. It is for us. A marketer for a dog food company might decide that the secret of more dog food sales is to make a food that tastes better. But that requires understanding how a dog thinks, which is awfully difficult. It turns out that the right formula is to make a dog food that dog owners want to buy. The purpose of this example isn't to help you market dog food better. It's to understand that there is almost always a disconnect between performance and appeal. That the engineer's choice of the best price and performance combination is rarely the market's choice. There are two voices in our head. There is the dog's voice, the one that doesn't have many words, but knows what it wants. And there's the owner's voice, which is nuanced, contradictory, and complex. It's juggling countless inputs and is easily distracted. Like the dog owner who is choosing based on 100 factors, but not taste, when was the last time you tasted your dog food? The people you seek to serve care about a range of inputs and emotions as well, not simply a contest of who's the cheapest. So how do you feel about that? You know, when you are walking along the aisle or when you have a conceptual idea of what your dogs should be eating, how do you pick your dog food? If you have going for dry dog food, how do you pick your dog food really? Is it actually getting your dog to walk along the corridor and they pick it based on the taste or is it on the packaging and what it says that represents how you feel? When you're looking for a raw food diet and same again, okay, I'm not an advocate or, uh, or against raw feeding at all, okay? But all I'm saying is that how, why did you feel that way? Do you actually see a visible improvement in your dog or was it just a feeling that you felt good feeding your dog, dog food? So I'm just playing devil's advocate over here. As you know, you know, this is just a presentation on dog food and what it all comes. And we know that many dogs, they thrive on what they're eating and many dogs don't thrive on what they're eating regardless of whether it is dry food, wet food, fresh frozen or anything like that. So in summary, there are many diets available. When I qualify a little bit more than a decade back, you look at the shelves of dog food, there are like maybe eight brands. Now, if you go to Pets at Home, there's like 27 brands. It's like, they must be getting better because there's so much dog food out there. But there are many, many diets available. Okay, Dry processed food is still the market leader at this moment in time. Each diet, as we discussed, there are pros and cons to each diet. So research and understanding is highly recommended for the choice of diet, really. Why are you feeding what you're feeding? Does it suit your dog best? Is there actually a best food for your dog? Okay, and a lot of it, it does depend on the owner's preference on how does, how do you manage the food and what's your dog thriving on and not? Because I've seen both sides. I've seen dogs that do not thrive on uh, dry food and they do much, much better on raw food diet. And I've seen vice versa, whereby if you feed them raw food diet, it just goes right through them. They just stay skinny and they have diarrhea and things like that and they just seem to thrive on, God forbid, chappy. So it is uh, one of those things whereby for me, just personally, just my personal view is that if you're wanting my view as a vet and as myself is, I believe the best food for the dog 
is the food that suits the dog best. Not everything is kosher because if there's a best food, it's just a human's. Is there a best diet? You must find out what does each individual need. Certainly there are much healthier diets and also healthy diets, but you know, is that actually a best? Really, really hard to say. And remember that marketing is aiming towards pet owners, you, pet guidance, not really a dog. Your dog just looks at the marketer, looks at all the different packs of food and just goes, okay, what are you going to feed me, so to speak? So this concludes my short little presentation to the lab for testing with this handsome little doggy over here having a very controversial, it's not dry, it's not wet, it certainly is not raw feeding as well, but I bet the dog likes it. I'm going to answer the questions. Please do type into the chat box. Okay, so the first question was, uh, slides. Okay, um, Ricardo, will we have a copy of this slide? Uh, no is a quick answer. Uh, however, this is being recorded and it's going to be loaded on YouTube. Okay, so the slides are, uh, they're just my own personal copy. And another question would be, at what age would a dog be considered a senior? So, uh, good question, very, very good question. So, usually we know that larger breed dogs, they live shorter than toy breed dogs or smaller breed dogs. So usually the, the sort of a ballpark figure we talk about eight years old, okay? However, if you are say a little chihuahua, okay, that's gonna live up potentially to 17, 18 years old, uh, eight years old, maybe 10 years old sort of thing, 10 years old, pretty much considered a little bit older. If you're a Great Dane, they're gonna live up to eight years old, maybe up to six years old, if we're talking about a little bit older, so to speak, does that make sense? Yeah, so it just depends, but eight years old is, Ballpark figure plus minus a few years on the left or right, depending on the size of the dog. Um, okay, next question would be from Lewis in a nutshell, from a health perspective, why is it said that raw is, uh, okay, let me just, just bear with me. Okay, in a nutshell, from a health perspective, why is it said that raw food diet are better for your dog than dry or wet, other than it being more natural because in the wild dogs would eat raw? I personally use and recommend dry food, but I've been told by raw food stockists that I should be recommending raw instead. So would love your take on it as a vet. Ho ho, that is why I'm going to get extremely polarizing and get myself killed by having this presentation like this. As I said, okay, personally, I personally believe the best food for, the, for your dog is the food that suits your dog best. If your dog thrives on raw food diet and you can be bothered to be careful about it and you do not mind handling raw food and potentially even have a separate fridge, some owners do that, some owners don't, compared to your normal food, by all means, go for it. If you, uh, your dog is not thriving on raw food diet just because it is supposedly better, uh, personally, I don't really uh, buy that at all because better is better. It's not raw food is better. It is a uh, better is better. If the dog is thriving on it, whatever food they're eating is better, so to speak. Okay, so that's my take on that. Um, and uh, likewise, you can also see totally different versions as well. Some vets that totally abhor raw feeding and they go like, oh, you're feeding raw food diet. You must be very, very careful. Salmonella can follow back there. I'm like, well, if your dog is thriving and you're happy to do that, go ahead. If you're giving dry food diet and your dog is happy, you know, go ahead. So, um, like I said, the best food is the dog is the food that suits the dog best. Okay, uh, Martina Foss has gone a, my main question will be linked to parasites. In the last four years, I've moved from dry food to raw food. My dog seems to have done incredibly well with raw food. Only problem I have with dry food was a lot of yeast in the dog's ears. With raw food, their ears have been squeaky clean. Very, very good point. I'll discuss that in a bit. Recently, though, I've had quite a bit of a setback. One of my dogs decided to have some issues with his hind legs. All of a sudden, he would stop moving and he's clearly in pain. So this happened three times in the span of first year of life. Recently, I ended up in an emergency vet and because he was fed a raw feed diet, they tested him for Neospora. They found a non-diagnostic presence of antibodies to Neospora. Could this be due to feeding the, the dog raw meat? I've been using raw food from a company I think is reputable, but how reputable a company that maybe is a risk of getting Neospora in the food. My vets are not so keen on raw food, even if we get it from a supermarket. So I've started to cook for, the, for your dog. Whoa. Martina, uh, first of all, a uh, great salute, cooking for your dog, that's quite impressive. I hope your dog really, really, really enjoys and appreciates and gives you a lot of sloppy kisses for that. That's pretty amazing. Um, so let's deal with the first bit first. So yes, 
So for raw, for dogs growing or so for dogs, sort of, when they're first having dry food, okay, and they have the skin issues, and I cons consider the ears part of the skin, because as you can imagine, it is, it is part of the skin structure. It just specialized skin that goes into the ear. So any ear disease can be extrapolated as skin disease, okay? And um, the, there is, it has been linked, if your dog has got some form of allergy or irritation that is causing skin disease from the dog food, from your, from your dry food, okay, and certainly going to a raw food diet because you have totally taken away the irritants that is in the dry food, that, uh, we have certainly seen many sort of cases whereby they actually get better, they get better skin coat, they get better skin quality, they have got less issues with skin because they've gone a raw food diet. Not all the time, but that is very, very commonly seen, okay? So it is not surprising that with the raw food, the quality of the skin may have improved and hence the ears become squeaky clean, as you mentioned, compared to uh, not the best quality skin and getting a lot of bombardment from the environment. Uh, and, and, and the skin produces more, um, more sebum. It's just like our, our skin it gets oily and that's normal, okay? But the thing is that it's like people with dandruff, if there's a lot of irritant and the skin doesn't like it, it's just producing more and more skin, hence dandruff, okay? So if the quality of the skin has been improved by the raw food, okay, certainly your ears will get, the ears will get better, okay? For the hind legs, yes. Okay, so Neospora certainly is one of the differentials for sudden hind leg lameness. And Neospora has been also been linked with raw feed diet. So that is what I was telling you with one of the papers that I presented, that they have found sort of uh, parasites like this, including Toxoplasma, Neospora in raw feed diet. So yes, potentially the risk of that may be higher, whether that particular Neospora has come from the food itself uh, remains to be seen really until they can pull out Neospora from the food. You can't say it's from food, but certainly it'll be a uh, slightly higher risk. So you're right to say that however reputable a company may be, uh, is there a risk of getting Neospora in the food? Well, there's a risk in getting anything anywhere really. Is it from the food? Is it from the environment? Is it from another carcass that your dog has accidentally found along the road that has got Neospora. There's nothing to do with the feeding whatsoever, but your dog happened to be quite interested, had a lick, had a bite, so to speak. Okay. Um, vets are not so keen on raw food. Well, some vets are not, some vets are, so it depends. Uh, getting for soon, okay, so not cook for the dog. So like I said, um, if you cook for your dog, it's no longer raw. Any sort of Neospora cyst would be killed and hence it wouldn't be a problem. Okay, which is also why in uh, for humans as well, you know, we talk about making sure your pork and chicken is properly cooked because if they're properly cooked, even if there are little neosporosis inside there, which there might be, it's uh, it, it'll be harmless, so to speak. All right, I hope that answered your question. And uh, Liz Martin, question two, is that okay? Of course it is okay. This is your game. Behaviorally, is there a link between high protein and aggression, high arousal level in dogs? Often when working reactive over aroused clients, I recommend a low protein diet, not puppies or pregnant, obviously part of the behavioral plan. I was wondering whether it's in a correlation with high protein and arousal and whether I should continue recommending this approach to help with reactivity arousal, please. Okay, so fundamentally, high protein diet, is it linked with um, is it linked with uh, highly strong dogs? Just like how a high sugar diet you give it to a kid, is it, they, is it gonna make them go crazy? So that is a very, very interesting question. So uh, without digressing too much, in children, they found that there actually isn't a link. So nonetheless, I do not give my boys any sugar drinks before sleeping, just asking for trouble, okay? But apparently there isn't a link. In dogs, what about dogs? So. Uh, that certainly has been linked to say that it's high protein, you give them more energy, so it makes them more excited, they are, uh, potentially increase aggression, things like that. So there is that talk over there. Okay, for me, I'm a little bit, mm, okay, because I've seen some very high energy dogs on extremely low protein. The owners just keep trying to reduce the protein, reduce, reduce, reduce as low as possible. It doesn't make a difference whatsoever. Okay. Um, and I've also seen some fairly high energy food given to dogs and they still appear to be extremely lethargic and speaking like this. So no obvious correlation. What I found is that a lot of stress dogs randomly, for me anyway, in my experience, it's usually due to stress uh, owners. <laughs> so if the owners are stressed, they are stressed. And sometimes if you can give, I mean, everything helps. Maybe it does help to give low protein diet, 
but I don't think there's a very, very clear cut evidence to say that, okay, look, my the energy or the aggression level of this dog is 10 out of 10 right now. If I give a low protein diet, you will drop it down to eight, six, seven, five, something like that. I don't think there's any clear cut uh, sort of uh, evidence behind that. But what I find is that more usually, okay, the highly strong dogs, highly stressful dogs, they tend to have similar stress level owners, okay? And sometimes if by telling them to give a low protein diet gives the owner something else to do, it well may work on the owners thinking that they're giving the dog less protein and it may calm the owners down and hence the dog may follow. But that is my extremely, extremely biased personal perspective, uh, judgmental take on that just based on my own personal experience. So uh, no, I can't think of any obvious papers that I can cite to say that there's a link, okay? Uh, but I'm not surprised if there is. So my advice to you is why not? Okay, why not? Uh, if you can get a low protein, fine. It doesn't affect the health in a dog in any way whatsoever. Any little thing to help you, to support you, to get the dog to where you want it to be, every little helps. Whether it helps or not is another thing. So Ricardo, I've been guided by my vet in choosing the food and the amount of meat in the ingredients listed. The higher, the better, I was told. Uh, yep, if it suits your dog, great. If it's causing issues, not so good. So the best person to ask, the best reflection, the best feedback is personally looking at your pet. That is the best thing I can say. The same with any diet, even in humans. Is the diet working? Well, if you're losing it, you're feeling great, the diet is working. Whatever you're doing, keep doing. Doesn't make sense. So don't forget the simple commonsensical thing of getting feedback from the subject, i.e. your dog, okay? Uh, marketing is interesting. One is designed to attract us, the owners to buy it rather than the dog. I absolutely agree. I select the food based on nutritional contents and a lack of additives and artificial coloring, etc. Very good. So this, I believe I've answered all the questions. Any other questions, please do type it inside there. Um, and I, that's that. Let me just, okay. This is a book I've written back in August. It is specifically for pet guardians, it is to teach you or show you how to develop best relationship with your vet. And I believe it's the first and only book that tells you how. Um, please do get it, it's available on Amazon in Kindle, Audible and paperback. And my only request is that when you do get it, when you read it, I would really, really appreciate any honest feedback. If it's rubbish, tell me it's rubbish. I will try to improve it in my next book. But um, I hope it brings some value to you. And that's a little fudge. Uh, not that she's reading the book, but you know, the, the Guardian is reading the book. And just to say the next uh, presentation will be next month. Uh, it'll be on the second Friday, not the first because of Easter. And we're gonna talk about CBD oil. Is it a myth or medicine? and learn about the latest craze. Well, it's not so latest right now, but yeah, certainly uh, CBD oil and its usage in pet. What is it? Is it useful? Is it harmful or complete nonsense? How you can have my little take on that next month. And with that, ooh, I can see one more question over here. Let's just have a little look in the chat box. Uh, nope, that's just a thank you very much. You're very, very welcome, Liz. Uh, you're also very, very welcome, Ricardo. If you do enjoy this talk, please do leave me a review. Okay, you can do that uh, on Google itself. Okay, uh, if you go to the website, drlennonfoo.com, if you search for it, you can leave me a Google review. Or you can also leave me a review at Amity Vets as well, which is the practice that I'm working in. But thank you very much for your time. And uh, I do hope you've received some form of uh, value from this. If you're on LinkedIn, hook me on LinkedIn. Um, I would love to have your review over there as well. That would be very, very helpful. But if not, I wish you guys an extremely pleasant evening and a fantastic weekend. Woohoo! TGIF! Thank you, Martina. Take it easy now. All keep safe. See you, Liz. Bye-bye.